I'm Jordan. And I'm Rosanna. And on this podcast, we explore how to take life off autopilot and relentlessly pursue a life worth living together. together. Hello, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of the Relentless Pursuit Podcast. This is our book club episode. Our very first book club episode. Very excited. Yeah, back in July when we were kind of mapping out this second set of 12 episodes, um, you had the idea of reading the same book and discussing it and kind of sharing just our thoughts and our perspectives. Um, And we took some time to maybe think of something that was a little bit more meaningful and a little bit more... um, appropriate for the climate and and what's really been going on in the world besides COVID these last seven months. Yeah. And I'm really excited about talking about this. Uh, We read How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. And uh, I think, you know, when we were first like sorting through some options, uh, this kind of rose to the top for us because we're both uh, very intentional with how we think and how we engage with the world. And part of that intentionality is I would say like exposing ourselves to ideas and to people and to perspectives that we wouldn't normally run across in maybe just a a typical day um, inside of the kind of happy bubble that we live in. Um, So I was excited to get into this with you and you and I don't always read the same books. No, we have (laughs) interests and tastes um, from fiction to nonfiction. Um, I think it's got got to be at least like 15 years since we've read the same book. Okay. That's That's a while. Oh, so this is a great excuse to again, come together over this and see maybe what it had to uh, to reveal to us. Okay. Yeah, we didn't choose something from Oprah's book club or Reese's book club. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of hype um, on Untamed and other books that, you know, people are reading. Um, but this one is a little bit more directed at engaging in our current world, in the current climate of what's been going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what makes, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit nervous about even just having an episode that talks about um, race and racism. Um, I feel like it's it's a topic that easily ignites uh, our passions, you know, for better or worse. And uh, you kind of go out on a limb by putting your perspectives out there. And I think our tendency is to, I wouldn't say recoil, but our, our, it, but it's to kind of keep our thoughts to ourselves in a sense and still be the best people that that we can be. Um, but I think it's important to have this dialogue for for a few reasons. One is that I think it's just important for you and I to to talk about because we we believe that we are good and intentional people um, who have the the power to enact you know some wellness into the world. And I think we have to talk about race at some point. And, and we do. Um, so this is one of I think, you know, many intentional conversations we've had about the topic. But I also am nervous, but kind of excited about doing it on our podcast, because I hope that this um, shows other people who are listening that these are the types of conversations that uh, can be difficult, but we encourage people to be having, um, especially with the ones that they love, so that they can explore any challenging topic in a way that is safe and a way that is meaningful and hopefully increases our understanding and our ability to um, kind of be the the people who we want to be in society. Well, one of the things that I really like about you, I like a lot of things about you, but you will, no matter what the topic is, if you're trying to figure it out or you're trying to figure out where you stand or what you believe, you will read literature on both sides of a topic to really understand people's perspectives and where they're coming from or like what, where are the gaps, where are the holes, like what are the questions you have? And you seek that out and you let those kind of help you determine kind of like where you want to be. Um, so that's one of the ways in which I look up to you is that like, you're always kind of like searching for the answer or always trying to get yourself closer to the answer. And so you'll read things that are maybe even on the side that you're maybe on and you'll read, you know, the opposition just to, to get a better balanced understanding of whatever the topic is. And I think engaging in this novel, um, in this book, in this way is really important because this isn't something I probably would have read or picked up mostly because, um, it's, I don't want to say that it's scary, but it's just, yep, you know, let's put it out there. I'm, yeah. I am, I am a white upper middle class 
woman who is educated and lives in a very safe and secure little bubble. Mm -hmm. And so like sometimes it's easier to not deal with it by not engaging with it and not even deciding where I stand on it. Right. So this has kind of like forced me to just, you know, open up my eyes a little bit, kind of wet my palate and determine like, am I going to move closer to this? Am I going to engage with it? Or am I going to just sit quietly and pretend that it's not out there? Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the the book and and um, everyone listening. We want you to understand like there's there's a lot to this topic, and so we're going to center our conversation on some of the ideas that are in the book. Um, and I think it's easy to you know cast uh, people who don't share exactly the same opinion as racist or as you know judgmental or as you know insert the the, the pejorative liberal in there. conservative right. And, Atheist, Christian, yeah, right. polarizing. And so, yeah, it, and so um, we're, we're going to share our, our honest responses to being exposed to a new idea. Um, and so uh, I hope that really the takeaway is not, oh, this is where Jordan and Rosanna stand on things. This is where they expect me to stand on things so much as we encourage everyone to adopt a similar approach of not uh, just kind of, um, I would say, shoot from the hip, here's my immediate response, and I'm going to stick to it no matter what mentality, so much as, you know, there's a lot of ideas and perspectives out there. I'm going to try to expose myself to as many of them as I can, and then absorb them, synthesize them, and decide for myself where I really stand and what good I can enact uh, because of that. Okay. So do we want to just talk a little bit about the book? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So this book, um, is not this is not an easy read. This is not like a light read. Like it's heavy in the fact um, that it's a combination of ethics, history, law, science, and then his personal narrative is like woven into that. So that's kind of like he talks about himself from the time he's a child until he's out of college and until, up until like present day. Yeah, <clears throat> um, and so you get to see kind of his transformation and his um, perceptions and understanding of who he is through the lens of like who he's told he is and who society believes him to be and then who he understands himself to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a lot of like history, um, you know, just history of like black culture and that transformation uh, through time and, and things that have happened. Um, so there's like a lot to unpack and digest as you read. Um, but then with the aim of trying to contribute to the formation of like a just and more equitable society. Yeah. Um and on top of that, too, I would call it a book of definitions. And like every chapter, the chapters are like these one word titles, and it just focuses on, for example, uh, like culture, gender, color. Uh, and uh, you know so on, like looking at um, race and race history and race relations through those lenses. Um, but it, every chapter begins with a definition, and in fact, the book itself begins with a definition of what is anti-racism. And I've I've heard the term before. I've heard some of the other terms before, but this um, this book is very preoccupied with trying to uh, like clearly spell out what a lot of these terms, whether they're new or whether they're familiar. Uh, really, really mean and how we can use them to operate um, based on that understanding to uh, try to explore race and understand uh, that a little bit better. Okay. So where do you want to go from here? Well, let's talk about, um, I'd say, the the opening definition because he he shares race or the definition of what it means to be a racist and what it means to be an anti-racist. So do you remember how how he he, um, framed those? Yes, but I think you could probably describe it better than I can. <laughs> uh, I'll try. Um, so at the the very outset, he creates what I would call a, a relatively like binary depiction of the two, essentially saying like either you are racist or you are anti-racist. And really what it gets at is that there's there's no one in the middle. And I think a lot of people might consider themselves or they might describe themselves to be not racist. So the way he depicts this as like, if you're not racist, you are still complicit in the racist um, ideologies and uh, systems and institutions that are existent. And so either you're anti-racist, which means someone who is proactively working against the elements of racism, or you're racist. 
And so this, what it does is it really takes people who might consider themselves to be disengaged or, you know, in the middle and kind of recasts them as potentially as being racist. And uh, it's the, the, the way that he depicts this, I think is in at first, like largely agreeable. It's like, okay, I get it. It's like, if I want to not be racist, then I need to be proactive against the forces of racism that are existent. And um, but what I found is that, you know, there's, I, I think people who would call themselves not racist um, are, or like kind of in the middle are, you know, they're not activists. They're, they're not necessarily like researching politics and participating in protests. Um, I, I think that that is, you know, I would say like maybe an oversimplification of a very complex issue. And it, if anything, it, it kind of puts more people on the defensive um, or more potential allies in a sense on the defensive to say like, well, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not racist, but I'm also, you know, not, you know, um, as necessarily engaged as I could be, or someone might want me to be. And, and, and it it can create, I hope, not, but like more of an atmosphere where it's easier to call someone racist if they're not as engaged as you would imagine them to be. So I didn't feel like that because, okay, so in the book's intro, he starts with um, saying that pretending to be colorblind, like, oh, I'm colorblind, I don't see color, I accept everybody, is actually a mask to hide racism because that just dismisses and denies race altogether. Mm -hmm. And so I think his point is like that you can't dismiss or deny race. Like, mm -hmm. so to say, like, oh, it, yeah, it doesn't matter what, you know, nationality or skin color you are, like, I, you know, I accept everybody. Like, but the whole point is we shouldn't be, like, erasing people's skin color or nationality. Like, we should be embracing who they are because of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I saw a little bit of that. Um, but he says the heartbeat of racism is denial. Um, so I was wondering if you agreed or disagreed with that statement. Because when I read, like, so you're either an anti-racist, meaning actively standing against racism, or you're a racist... I actually thought to myself, like, I'd probably won't be one of those people that claims that they're in the middle. Like, I would never say that I hate someone based on the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, I'm not doing anything to, like, st actively stop or engage with the racism that's going on. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, whoa, I need to pick a side. Yeah. And so I, I didn't feel like that at all. I thought he was, I think maybe his perspective is to motivate people who, like, if you think you're not racist, like, so then what are you doing to ensure that racism doesn't continue. And if you're doing nothing, what does that say? Like, you're either hot or cold. Well, like, saying, you're yeah, in the middle, you're you complicit. might as well... Yeah, correct, you're, you're complicit correct. So you in are allowing complicit. these things to And if you're happen. allowing those things to happen, then technically you're a racist. You're yeah. passively a racist. See, but I would question that, too, because I... And, and this is where we get more into, like, the, the heart of what the chapters are getting at, because I... I feel like there's different levels of engagement. And one of those, like I would consider to be like the way we parent, for example. Like I, I would argue, I would contest that we parent in an anti-racist way. Like we are proactively teaching our children the value of every human life that they come in contact with. Um, I would even say like the, the way that we, we attempt to live out our life, like attempts to demonstrate that value. But that's on a very individual basis, right? At the same time, we can retreat back into our household and, and deliver a happy life without ever really engaging heavily with it. So I wonder, and he doesn't talk about, he doesn't talk about family um, and parenting uh, a whole lot. So I, I just wonder to what extent does that qualify? Um, does that meet his threshold of anti-racist engagement? Well, and I, don't, I didn't read his bio enough to know if he has children. He does. He has... Um, one like young daughter okay. and a wife. Okay. Well, and I think that's, you know, the way that we choose to parent or the way that like we actively look at what it means to be American, even explaining that to our kids because they have friends who are um, different races and nationalities. And we talk about like mm -hmm. that they are American. They, they are born here and they are American and what that means. And it's mm -hmm. not based on the color of your skin that you're American. Mm -hmm. And then we talk even further about like, well, what does it mean to be human? And we talk about all the ways in which we are similar, although food and customs and expressions of mm -hmm. identity are different, like that we talk with our kids about how similar everybody is down to the core. Yeah. Um, and not everybody parents that way, not all generations parent in that way either. Um, instead of getting race to like divide and like determine difference with our kids, like we're mm -hmm. looking more at commonality. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's that's a lot of what I think this book comes down to, too, which I like is like he, he gets to the point where it's like just like love the individuals um, for as, as beautifully different as they are. And what I really liked about this was that he I expected to be more defensive as I read through this, um, but I, I wasn't. And gratefully so, because it, this is not the kind of book that comes out and is like just overtly like, you know, white uh, supremacists and, you know, white power and privilege and this and that. Um, but it's more so like he, he internalizes a lot of these things. And a lot of this is like, almost like this coming of age story for himself, where he progressively starts in like third grade, I think, like recognizes some aspects of, of race, um, that he then like learns and then improves his perspective. And then he has other experiences or other mentors in his life that help him like progressively, I think, in, enlarge and, and improve his perspective. And uh, I think that's kind of what we adopt too, where a lot of it comes down to not action so much as mindset, like how are we viewing the people in our lives? And to what extent, this is where he gets a little bit vaguer, but to what extent do the, uh, he talks about policies a lot, are the the policies and the institutions that give shape to our lives, um, uh, to what extent are those improving or not improving the lives uh, with equity across the spectrum? Well, let's go back to that. Um, That was one of the questions I had is like, when does he first become aware of his racial identity? And it's his parents taking him to like a school that they're like registering for. Um, So I don't remember if it was like public or private. I think it was private, right? Yeah. Um, And they're like taking a tour and the lady is like leading him through the school and they're answering questions. And like his big question all of a sudden is like, are there, where are the black black teachers? teachers, Yeah. And she's like, well, we have one. And Mm -hmm. he's like, well, where are the rest of them? And it was kind of like this good question. Like, are are there no more? Like there's, (laughs) there's just the one. Well, even his parents then are like, they explain to the, the lady, they're like, he's been, he's noticed his race very much at this early age. Yeah. So I thought that was just a good question for us too. And even thinking about our kids, like, when did you become aware of your racial identity? And like, where did you learn about it from? Mm -hmm. Like, we're white. Like, at what point do you realize that? At what point do you know that? And Mm -hmm. at what point does does that start to make sense? And what point do you realize that other people are not the same as you? Well, that's one thing that I think is very, I think it's very difficult for me to answer that question because like I am white, I've been raised in a largely white community. And there are very few times in my life that I could point to at a gathering of any kind and say, like, I was in the minority. And I think that that's the opposite for, you know, so many of other, so many other minorities. They kind of live in the white world and are more aware of that distinction. Whereas I never really had to think about that, except in a few instances where that was what distinguished me from others. Well, and I think I grew up in the same kind of, you know, white suburbia. Um, and I remember that there were like three or four kids in the school that did not have the same color, same like right. skin color as everybody else. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I don't know that I recognized it at the time, but I remember like being a little bit older, maybe fifth or sixth grade where other kids were starting to point out differences yeah. where it was like, oh, they're not like everybody else, except they were because they've been growing up with us since preschool and have been doing all of the same things. Yeah. But it was like, all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, they, they're different. Right. Whereas, right, and that's the beauty of kids. Like they just don't even know it. They don't even care. Right, you know? <laughs> right, right. And I mean, we've had that same instance happen with our kids too, where it's they, the community around us now is a little bit more diverse. Not mm-hmm. a lot more diverse, but a little bit more diverse. But mm-hmm. like having that conversation and be like, oh, well, this person is Indian or this person is Asian, and they're like, oh, like it, that it never dawned on them. Right. But even him as like a third grader was very much aware of like mm-hmm. who he was. And who he wasn't and like where the people like him were and were not. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I can't imagine growing up in a world like that because that is not like the area in which we are, we live. All right. I think that's the important thing of reading it. And there were some passages that I thought like just depicted to me like so well, like some, just some aspects of his experience. But that's, that's why I like reading this because I mean, here we are like just kind of talking about our background and he is you know he's black and he has studied this topic of of blackness and of race relations and of history for years and of multiple 
degrees and not now published like multiple books on the topic. He's dwelled on this for a lifetime. So I feel a little bit out of my element, honestly, to, to say like, okay, like we're going to absorb this and, you know, try to synthesize this with our experiences because we, we really are coming from two different sets of experiences in many ways. Um, but I think all the more important to read and to expose ourselves to something that like in our normal course of life, we really wouldn't have the opportunity to experience. Or we would be too afraid to engage in. And I think Mm. that's some of it. Um, He says, um, he recommends that we approach anti-racist work with vulnerability. So my question was, why is it difficult to acknowledge our own beliefs or perspectives as being racist? How can recognizing our own beliefs create an opportunity for self-education? And how can you help others in their own reflection and learning? I know, I've got like question after (laughs) questions. Three questions on top of each other. Um, But I think this topic does lend itself to vulnerability. Like who wants to say like, I am in the like white majority and I'm going to talk about this topic that like might offend somebody or step on their toes or ruffle their feathers. Like not because I'm ignorant, but because I'm trying to learn more and I'm trying to figure out like, what I think about it and how I want to engage with it moving forward. So it's just like, are we brave enough to say like, Hey, this is the book that we're reading. Cause like when we posted, it it was like, okay, like Mm -hmm. what will people's response be for Mm -hmm. good or bad? Like, will people join us in reading this and engaging in this topic Mm -hmm. or will people be like, Nope, not for me, Mm -hmm. you know, unfollow, which I could care less because it doesn't matter to me, but like, you know, Are, are we going to push each other to kind of grow in areas in which we don't know enough about or are not currently engaged in? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like talking about, and like to his point about vulnerability, like talking about uh, race and being potentially in a position where you would realize some of your own racism um, it definitely makes you feel defensive. I mean, it changes the narrative of how we see ourselves. Like no one that... I can imagine would overtly state, yes, I'm racist, right? Correct. And I mean, maybe you could go back like, you know, generations in American history and, and people would be more overt with that, where that was more of a, like a public perspective that, that people held and it was more socially accepted. I think there's, there's been a lot of improvements in, in society. And one of those is that now to be deemed a racist is a very negative term. And so to apply it to ourselves is very uncomfortable um, because it's like, no, I'm not. I care about everybody and I try to afford everyone the same respect. And and we can have this idea of who we are. So it requires vulnerability because you have to let go of that a little bit and acknowledge that maybe even in your complicity, you have permitted certain disparities to continue. But you have to own who you are, good or bad. And so I just, I don't like that notion that, that people are unwilling to, to own who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, But here's the thing. So he is a black man and Mm -hmm. multiple times in this book, he talks about how he works to be an anti-racist yet multiple times in his life, he has been racist, racist against white people, racist against other black people, racist against um, women. Women, racist against, you know, I know, but but, right, right, just this, this notion of sexist against women or against, um, people who, um, are gay or lesbian, like, Mm -hmm. so he talks about how he has really put up his guard and has pushed other people out for being different for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And he says like, yeah, I was racist against my own people or like black people like this or black people like that or white people like, like, so I think that was almost comforting in the fact that like, we all have prejudice of things that we're afraid of and mm-hmm. push people away or keep people away or say or do things that are not kind and loving. But how do you continue to like move past some of those things and grow? Yeah, I mean, it's comforting because he doesn't come out with this this finger pointing. It's much more of this this confessional, almost like this modeling of how he, he recognizes some inadequacies with his own perspectives towards people and works to fix those. And and I feel like, like he kind of has two elements. Like one is that individual element where he kind of argues like you need to continually refine and work on the way that you view others because there's 
uh, a lot of implicit biases that we we tend to hold and, and are not even aware of how they're operating in like within our our interactions and within our thoughts. And that's one of the things that struck me too is that like it's, there's almost like this tendency for us as humans to um, I would say like to have thoughts and to cast people certain people as like the other and to attach like negative attributes to that. It seems like almost like this innate thing and it takes work to recognize and counteract that. And so one thing I found like that book is kind of inspiring and helping you feel like, all right, he, this is his journey. He's provided uh, something of a model for that. And he, like he admits he's not perfect, but this is the work that he's trying to work on with himself. I can do that too. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked about how this was like a combination of ethics, history, law, science, like all of that. Those parts were harder for me to read. What was easier for me to read was his story Mm -hmm. and this like um, understanding of himself and the world and the way the world operates and even how his perspective of people has changed over time, Um, being racist, moving towards anti-racism. Like him and I are probably couldn't be more opposite in a variety of ways, but I felt very connected to him and I felt very connected to his story where he's just like constantly trying to rethink like, who am I? Who, who do I want to be? And even making mistakes along the way in that journey, like, you know, um, putting other people aside or casting them aside because they were different than him. And, but then like moving through that and working through that. And I just, I could really connect with that. Yeah. Now, one of the, the statements that he makes towards the end that I, I really wanted to have him explore a little bit more, and um, he, he didn't, though he, he references a few things about it, is he says, like, the, the root cause of racism is self-interest. And that, that kind of reverberated with me a little bit because, in a sense, like, when you think about, like, what you want for yourself and for your survival and for your children and their, you know, trying to provide them with the, you know, everything you could possibly provide them with that does seem to come at, you know, the opportunity cost of what, you know, others may be able to provide for themselves or for their children. And I, I wanted him to explore that a little bit more. What he gets much more heavily into is the the idea of policy. And this is where I would like the history, like there's so much like interesting details about the history. But when he talked about like institutions and policies, like it, I felt like that was much more in theory. Um, like the professor side of him was like really coming out. Like it would be great to like re-examine certain policies and take out racist policies and replace, replace them with anti-racist policies. But I feel like looking at policy in like a, this strictly like racial, like binary kind of way is an oversimplification of you know, so many of the existing policies that are out there. Like we can agree that there are historically and even today, like flat out racist policies that are detrimental to certain people of color. But I think there's also even some well-intended policies that have elements of them that uh, have the potential for good, um, but also elements of them that have the potential for negative as well. And I, I feel like there's there's a lot of complexity that gets, uh, like I've said, oversimplified by looking at it strictly through a racial lens. I I, I don't think I can add anything to that because <laughs> a lot of that's, I, I mean, I'll be honest, a lot of that stuff is over my head. Um, things that probably were a little bit more um, interesting to me were even talking about things like as he's um, getting ready to apply for colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, and looking at like the education system and like looking at like taking an SAT prep class mm-hmm. and the kinds of people that are taking an SAT prep class and the kinds of people that aren't, mm-hmm. the people that have like the tutors that are tutoring them how to take the test. And, you know, he was looking at that in terms of like race. Um, but then he was also talking about that in terms of like classes, in yeah. terms of like those who are affluent mm-hmm. versus like his parents, right, could afford those tutors and prep and tests for him. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I like about this book too is that it draws in like class um, and equity along like poverty lines and things like that where, Mm -hmm. you know, people on, people from a variety of backgrounds kind of get lost in the shuffle of those things where like even in education, although it's set up to be fair and equal, it is not fair and equal. Mm -hmm. 
And it's so there's like that the, disparity there. The act, I think he talks about like the access, like these things exist and anyone is welcome to take advantage of it, except like who has the access to truly do that. And that's where um, like economics and income really plays a role as well. Um, so I was, was really fascinated to read about that. Um, and he talks about, in terms of economics, he talks about there's a chapter on uh, capitalism as well. And that was one where I felt I would, like I, I, I was harder to convince during that chapter. Other chapters, I was like, yeah, like I totally see this. And that was one of the chapters where I, I felt like there was, there was more to it. So I, I almost want to read this book again a year from now because there's so much to unpack from it in terms of the history and the definitions that I, I kind of want to live out like some of these things or, or continue to look at um, – the the ideas and perspectives that are here and and weigh them a little bit more see them in action in different arenas a little bit more and then come back to this text and then i I think a second reading a year from now will help me like more um just just understand and digest it yeah i agree i don't think this is like a one and done um you know we read it for the purpose of talking about it here and now um but like if i had even more time to kind of like go through this a little bit more slowly and like even just read one chapter at a time and like really kind of sit with it and examine like some more perspectives or like when he mentions something, even be able to research it like a little bit further. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of those books that you can use as like a way to kind of study a topic and not just kind of read and put it aside. Right. Um, But I think really what he's getting to um, through all of this is that being anti-racist isn't like a destination. It's not like if you say or do or agree with one thing, like you're there. Um, But it's like this journey that's very deliberate and consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's what he points out along his journey where he's like, multiple times in my life, I've been racist. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to work to not be racist and to be Mm -hmm. anti-racist. And the work of that is through like self-awareness, self-reflection, and then like some kind of action. And I, I think he goes further too. So, I, like that's the that the the individual element, and I think there's this more like public element too. Um, because at some point or another, if you're going to reshape society to be more equitable, like it does require it requires more than one person, or even more than individuals working on their own. And so he kind of casts this vision, and I think it's a a, a a bold and inspiring vision of a society that kind of gets over its racism. And there really is equal opportunity and, and equity for all people. Um, but he, he talks about um, kind of like founding the, the research, the anti-racism, anti-racism research center. And so I think that's the other half of it too, where you have individuals who are working on themselves, but then also there's like that teamwork and that collaboration and that study. And he even talks about like trying things. And when we try to implement something, we follow it closely to see how it turns out. And if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, not getting frustrated, but then like you're learning from that and finding the next thing that we believe can work. Yeah. So do you have any other kind of thoughts or just anything you want to kind of use to kind of close this out? Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, I guess like my takeaway from reading this and, and I would consider this conversation now, like just scratching the surface for oh, the two of us. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. But it is uh, that the kind of thing that, like he says, like it does require, it requires work and kind of this ongoing self-examination. So that is, that's one of my biggest takeaways. And, you know, I'm very willingly like follow his lead to examine my own experiences and perspectives and thoughts and, um, try to make sure that it matches what I, what I say they are kind of going back to like the stories that we tell ourselves. Like I do, try to picture myself as a good person who is going to use the resources at my disposal to make the world a better place. And so, um, you know, at times the way I might envision, you know, the world is a better place and, or what it takes to get there may not match exactly someone else's. And I think that's okay, but at least engaging in the dialogue, engaging in the personal work, engaging in the world around us is what's necessary. And that's what I'm interested in, um, reading other works and, um, just continuing to like follow through that process with you, um, to try to, um, you know, make something good happen in the world. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this isn't an easy topic to talk about. It's not an easy to- topic to even read about because even as you're reading, you're like, 
you know, you're taking it in and you're, you're questioning yourself and your own attitudes, your own beliefs, your own actions. One's in the past, one, you know, what's what you're currently in the present. And then, you know, asking yourself, where do you want to be in the future? That we are constantly moving forward before we're left behind. Yeah. Yeah. So we do uh, recommend to each of you that if you have the opportunity uh, that you read this and uh, just like you heard Rosanna and I dialogue through it, um, it doesn't mean that you read it and and agree wholeheartedly and nod your head with every sentence, um, but that there's an open opportunity to uh, think through um, what someone else is presenting to us and synthesize that with um, other things that we're continuing to learn and engage with. He is doing a talk, right? More locally? doing a local talk uh, for us. We're signed up on November 9th uh, to attend. He is going to join the Schomburg Library as well as uh, there's several a other few libraries. A few neighboring have, libraries, yeah. Yeah, opened up the opportunity to do that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from him himself and maybe we can invite him to be on the show with us too. So maybe we can link that because people will be listening to this and then mm-hmm. the talk happens really right after that. So right. we can uh, link that on our show notes so mm-hmm. people can get to it. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining with us today. And uh, like I said, there's certain things that we've said that you may agree with or you may disagree with. And I think that's great. Um, It's all about having honest dialogue and doing the best job that we all can to try to turn the world into what we envision it to be. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. For those of you who had read it, we would love to hear maybe some of your thoughts, maybe what some of your takeaways were. So feel free to reach out via social media or even on our website and email. So we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to today's show. We hope you will use this conversation as a starting point for your own. We hope you're encouraged to think and act more intentionally. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website, therelentlesspursuitpodcast.com, where you can find notes on today's show, plus additional blog posts. And you can subscribe to our free members list. Please subscribe, leave a review, and share with your friends. Facebook and Instagram are two great places to connect with us for daily doses of our quotable quotes, behind the scenes, and real-time photos, videos, and challenges. Until next time, let us know how you are taking life off autopilot. And relentlessly pursuing what matters.